Keith, the stage is yours. Uh, hello, everyone. Um, first of all, uh, thanks to the IES for uh, having us here. This is the first time I've been in the Netherlands, so it's pretty exciting. And I'm happy to be here for such an event to drum up support for this research. So as uh, mentioned, so I'm the president of a nonprofit that has launched a crowdfunding platform specifically for research of this type, and we'll talk about that more later, and also outreach coordinator for the Global Health Span Policy Institute, which works with governments to try to raise awareness and get governmental funds for this research as well. So what my talk's going to be about is how we get to a societal turning point for support of life extension and exponential technologies in general. So earlier today, you've heard uh, you know, from Oliver and Aubrey about some details of the research. Uh, Tatiana talked about some ethics. And Liz also mentioned something about uh, why it's moral for us to work on this research. So I'm going to try to reference all of their talks in mine and kind of show how we can move ahead to make this really publicly acceptable and get everybody on board to work together. So we feel that the best way to do this is to follow this battle plan, where first we want to have a clear and inclusive message that we can unify our movement with so that we don't alienate any potential friends and engage as many people as possible. Uh, secondly, we want to pair that with a consistent call to action so there's something to do uh, instead of just talk about it. And thirdly, once we have those two in place, we want to mobilize and leverage that into really big initiatives that will transform uh, the world. So before we talk about how we're going to do that, or hopefully going to do that in our cause, I think it's very instructive to look at an example from the recent past that was very successful. So. Uh, this has to do with the war on cancer, and I'm referencing a book here by Siddhartha Mukherjee, The Emperor of All Maladies, which is also, I believe, like a PBS TV special as well. So it basically tells the story about how two activists, Mary Lasker here and Sidney Farber, basically transformed the notions of cancer. So Mary Lasker was basically a, a socialite whose husband had cancer, so that was, she had a vested interest in it. And Sidney Farber basically did uh, what would later be called chemotherapy, kind of the earlier earliest research in that regard. So basically, what they did turned out to be what are essentially a bunch of slick PR maneuvers to enlist the public uh, in the support of this research. So one thing that they really hit upon that was a slam dunk was this idea of the Jimmy Fund, which I know I vaguely remember. I think it's still around. It is still around, but it was more televised back in maybe the 80s and before that. And um, basically what their big insight, I think, was they realized that in general, uh, people don't conceive of diseases like cancer. Um, it's not immediate. It's this far off thing that I'll, I'll worry about 50 years from now, right? So they came up with this plan to really humanize and personalize the disease through this idea of focusing on this one boy, his name really wasn't Jimmy, I forget, it's like Gustav or something like that. And they built this whole marketing campaign about him. How do we save this one boy, Jimmy, with cancer? And they had telethons, millions of people writing letters to their congressmen, millions of dollars poured in. And they used that leverage to then do other kind of very bold maneuvers, like essentially calling out President Nixon here in the US uh, in a full page spread in the New York Times and the Washington Post and basically said, hey, why are you not doing something about this? We all care about it. And it worked. In, in 1971, the National Cancer Act was passed, uh, which is generally considered to be the birth of the war on cancer. So I think there's a lot that we can look at from this example and say, how do we apply that to our movement? So now some people might say, hey, you know, was the war on cancer really successful? Was it as successful as it could have been? I'm not going to get into detail of these curves, but the point is, you know, there's, there's debate about it. But I think there's no uh, argument that these early advocates transformed the idea. What was once a pariah disease in the 1940s, if, you know, your uncle had cancer, you just put him in the corner and nobody talked about him, right? And they transformed this into a national priority, at least for the U.S., that became part of the fabric of growing up in America, which is very powerful. So, can we do something similar for life extension? Is there a Jimmy Fund equivalent, or is there a way that we can galvanize the public in this kind of one-two punch that they did? So, as mentioned earlier, I believe that we can do that by following this little battle plan here. So the first part, clear and inclusive message. What do we mean by this? So, 
first part of this is we should focus on the immediate and the relatable of alleviating suffering. Someone might not know how to conceive what's it going to be like 100 years from now, but the average person now especially knows that cancer and Alzheimer's disease really suck. So if you can convince people that the best way to solve these horrors is to research the underlying causes and that will give you those cures most effectively, I believe that is a very winnable point. The next part here, I believe, uh, is that we should focus on the fact that this is not something that's beyond human. So I'm referencing the term transhumanism here, which I'm sure a lot of us ostensibly are transhumanists, right? But I feel like it is important that we really, again, humanize this message. This, uh, as I believe uh, Tatiana had mentioned earlier, this really isn't transhuman. This is human. I would argue that this is actually the defining characteristic of what it means to be human, using our tools to better our situation. So this is something that we've always done. So uh, this picture that I got up over here is from the Epic of Gilgamesh. This is the first written work, first great work of literature that humanity has ever produced you know, on some clay tablets in what is now Iraq that were discovered years ago. And it tells the story of basically a king who goes on a journey to overcome diseases and death. And this part is a very moving part here where his friend Enkidu uh, dies and uh, he's holding his friend and he refuses to believe he's gone and he holds his body for seven days until literally maggots are coming out of his eyes until he realizes that his friend is gone and then he basically decides that, you know, this is for the birds. Uh, how do we solve this problem, right? So I feel like that's a really good point is that what we're talking about here is not alien. It's not strange. This has always been part of the dialogue and we, we've just had different ways of sort of kind of coping with that and religious narratives and different ways of interpreting it. But we've always thought about this and I think that's an important point to engage people with. <coughs> And another key point that's kind of related to that as well is that we should really strive to make allies instead of enemies. So, for example, uh, there can be seen as a conflict between certain religious movements and what we're trying to do. But if you really think about it, there's a great commonality here that can be focused on, you know, Jesus healing the sick here. And I feel like that is something that we can really, again, focus on. So instead of demonizing people who have a religious mindset, instead I think it's more instructive to think, what is it about religion that is so attractive? And I think it's one of the answers here is meaning, a sense of uh, a narrative, a sense that your actions have purpose in the greater scheme of life. And I feel like we can really inspire people to feel that same impulse. You know, if you help this research, you will impact everyone you've ever known and loved and could potentially save them from horrifying things like Alzheimer's disease. And I feel like you can really, again, win that point. Um, and just as an interesting sort of historical note here, uh, this is uh, Nikolai Fyodorov here, who was one of the uh, initiators of what became known as cosmism in Russia. I believe this was the late 19th century. And his ideas really combined kind of radical transhumanism with uh, orthodox Christianity. So times in history, these things have actually been merged together. It's just interesting to note that. And on a funny point of why I feel like we don't have to make enemies, uh, when I was a kid and there was commercials for Flintstones vitamins, you know, to make you healthier, this wasn't the message. It wasn't like, hey, to be healthier, you got to give up God. It was just like, no, these are good for you. You should take them. There was no need for that combat, and I think there is no need for that combat now. <laughs> Keanu Reeves over there. So the next part that I think we should always keep in mind with our message here is uh, cognitive biases. The idea that our mental machinery is just not naturally geared to thinking about the deep future or radical change. Um, so we should not demonize uh, knee-jerk critiques, you know, that some have been mentioned before, like, oh, you know, I don't, uh, what about overpopulation or does living longer mean I'm going to be super decrepit longer, right? We should expect those critiques and know how to handle them with data and kind of like uh, Liz was mentioning when she kind of had her uh, come to Jesus moment or maybe it was a come to Aubrey moment in that case. Um, <laughs> you know, let's take a moment and remember here like there probably was a moment in your own life 10 years ago, eight, 12 years ago where you didn't think like this but then you came across the information and said oh, this is a good idea. So I think it's important that when we talk to people just Consider them not as enemies, but consider them as people that maybe haven't been presented with this compelling case, and maybe they'll be amenable if you talk about it with compassion and intelligence. 
And just a few examples of kind of the nitty gritty psychology of cognitive biases that are relevant is the first one is, is scope neglect. Um, people in general overrank the singular in comparison to the group. For example, a classic example here, there's a lot of psycho psychological studies that bear this out. Um, most people will give a lot more money to help this you know, one starving child in country X than they would give to s help a million children in country X. Because when you have that one child, you're like, oh yeah, I can really uh, picture it and it's, it's sad and I want to help that person. It, it, it pulls on your emotions where when you just say numbers like a billion, you don't really have that same idea. And this is exactly what the Jimmy Fund that I mentioned earlier, they s basically slam dunked this point. So it's a lesson to learn, I believe. Another one is called hyperbolic discounting. So this is basically the fact that most people don't rank the future as highly as they should in relation to the present. So uh, I guess to use a funny example, so say if you really like dark chocolate, they say, hey, do you want a thousand chocolate bars in a month or do you want 10 chocolate bars? right now, right? And a lot of people would choose for the immediate because it's right in front of you, it's pulling on your physical hardware, you can, you know, your mouth is salivating, and like, yes, I want that right now, I can envision myself eating it tomorrow, I don't want to wait, uh, it's fine, right? So as a way to sort of get around this point, you have to really work on shifting your perspective uh, with interesting narratives. So example, one uh, thought experiment that I do with a lot of crowds that really overcomes this point, I won't do it with you guys since everyone here is pro-longevity, I'm assuming, but I typically ask three questions, right? So the first question I'll say, assuming you're healthy, you stay healthy, do you want to be alive 50 more years, right? If the person is over 40 or 50, their answer is usually initially no, like, ah, you know, I don't know, 80 years is enough, or this or that, you know, whatever, I'm not demonizing it, that's just typically the answer. Okay, leave that answer alone. Now let me ask you two other questions. Do you want to be alive tomorrow? Most people say yes, right? And they go, okay, let's assume nothing changes, you're just as healthy, your friends and family are just as healthy. Do you suspect the answer to that question will change tomorrow? Most people say no. Uh, tomorrow I will also say I want to be alive tomorrow. But if you look at it mathematically, I asked the same question twice. One of them used mathematical induction, you know, infinite tomorrows versus 50 years. But why was the answer different? it's because of cognitive biases, right? So it's just an idea to think of when you're dealing with people, if you're having a conversation, these are things that you should think about as ways to potentially uh, expose flaws in logic to help bring people around if you are engaged in such a discussion. On a personal note, I find this idea of cognitive biases very interesting to think about as well as a, as a galvanizer for, for us advocates, right? Uh, how do you get up in the morning? So I find it very useful to overcome my own scope neglect by sometimes thinking about death um, like a very real, like physical person. It's a real thing that's waiting for us and aging and it's not in the abstract. So I can really think, okay, like I don't want that, this person sitting on the opposite side of the chess table, I cannot let them win, right? So I find it very useful also on a personal sense. Or another way of thinking about that is, you know, a, a great battle here, where, you know, over here you got all the diseases and disabilities of aging, and the orcs of mortar storming Helm's Deep here, and you're this guy. So. If you care about your friends and family, you might want to think about how can we start, you know, kick that damn ladder down. <laughs> so I just find it useful to think about. And finally, uh, as another kind of just broad point, um, timing of what we advocate matters. And uh, Ray Kurzweil here is very famous for kind of noting in, in his own life and his own technological breakthroughs like the flatbed printing scan, the things that he, that he invented, that knowing when the technology is right is very important for um, you know, making it happen. Like being too late is obvious, but you can also be too early in which sustaining support structures and other technologies are not there to support what you want and it will also fail, right? So in this case, even though he's also famous uh, for talking about ideas like mind uploading, which was mentioned earlier in Tatiana's talk, I'm gonna maybe use that logic a little bit against, <laughs> against that other point of his in that I think maybe mind uploading should wait a little bit when we're trying to really make mass messages and things like that because, um, the supporting stuff is not quite there yet. For example, we don't really have a clear definition for consciousness right now. So if you don't have that definition, you can't really have a metric for success here. So I think it's a little bit early and a little bit disingenuous to try to <coughs> preach to people that this is definitely doable and definitely desirable. Better to, for now, focus on curing Alzheimer's disease, curing cancer, through curing the aging process or aspects of it. Or 
you could end up with this. I'm not sure how many of you guys are familiar with this ancient aliens guy on the History Channel. But, uh, you know, he's a common meme that pops up for just, like, ridiculousness. And uh, th this is actually a real thing. Like, I was watching the History Channel with my dad, like, three days ago, and there was a special on transhumanism and life extension, and this guy popped up to talk about it. So as, as much as I kind of love this guy, I don't think we want him to be our spokesman. So, you know, just that's something to think about. And now, finally, to round out this message part, uh, some of you might think to yourself, well, the messaging stuff, all this trying to bring the public with us, it doesn't really matter. All that matters is the research, right? Once you know, a really good therapy happens, people will want it, and then everyone's mind will be changed. So why do we even care about this, right? Well, I think here's a really damn good reason of why we should care about it. When Bush vetoed the stem cell lines and basically said, the industry back 10 years. If we don't bring the public along with us, we risk pushback and legislation like this, where if everyone was super well informed about stem cells and, you know, embryonic stem cell doesn't mean like you're killing a fetus and like har harvesting its brain. Or, that's what they were talking about on the floor of the Congress. I heard it on C-SPAN. So there was a lot of disinformation and that led to this. Another classic example here is uh, anti-GMO stuff. I feel like that was a failure of the movement of you know, people who support genetic engineering to get ahead of it and inform the public because a lot of the anti-GMO movement is completely misinformed and it takes no recognition for the fact that we, we have been doing genetic engineering since like the dawn of behaviorally modern humans. Now we're just doing it like wisely or it, directly instead of just willy-nilly. So I feel like, again, that, that was a failure. That's something we don't want to repeat. We want to make sure that people really understand the research and the ideas of life extension technology so that when Liz Parrish succeeds, the public will be behind it and there won't be a massive backlash. Okay, so now we have this idea of what are good ideas for messaging. So, like mentioned before, we want to pair this to a consistent call to action and we feel that that consistent call to action can be crowdfunding. So for those of you who haven't seen our campaigns yet or don't know what this is about, it's basically a crowdfunding platform that we built that's basically like Indiegogo or Kickstarter but for research of this type. And now you might ask yourself, you know, why bother? Why not just do Indiegogo and Kickstarter campaigns? Many reasons, but just a few of them. By centralizing all research projects that have to do with this under one umbrella, you really make it much more accessible to the public and also they know what they're going to get. Where if you go to Kickstarter, unless your project is one of the chosen ones that's featured somehow, which is never going to happen, you're not going to get any organic traffic or anything like that. Where anybody who comes to lifespan.io knows that everything I look at is going to have to do with life extension or curing diseases. So if I care about that, I know where to go. And also, because we are a nonprofit, we can crowdfund, at least in the U.S., for for-profit companies and donations to their projects would be tax deductible. So that's interesting. So on a broad level, what are the benefits of this? Obvious one, raise money. Also, this allows advocates to walk the walk because, you know, I'm sure many of us are pretty active on Facebook and LinkedIn or whatever. And there's always these huge groups with like 20,000 people, you know, transhumanist X, life extension that. And, you know, for many years, there's just kind of like an echo chamber where everyone's just talking about it, right? But if you have a continual call to action that people can get involved in, uh, you always have somewhere to go. And if you're talking to someone who's interested, you can say, hey, if you want to help, Go do this instead of like, oh, what an interesting conversation. Now back to my life. Also, democratizes research. So this, again, hits the points that, that Liz brought up where um, if people are super informed about the process because all these projects are, uh, the results are open access, you bring the public along with the technology and they'll be more informed. They'll be less likely for political pushback, as mentioned. And also, um, to the question about, oh, will this only be, be for the rich, this partially addresses that as well. So let's just, for example, use uh, gene editing as an example here, CRISPR or something. So we've all heard like st stories of like, you know, the evil empires, you know, like Monsanto giving Terminator seeds that don't replicate to some starving countries, right? But if we live in a future where people can buy all the equipment they need to modify genes for a hundred bucks and the information of how to do that is open source, then the small guy can fight back against the big guy. We have given the power to the people, and I think that's super important for many reasons. And as I touched upon a little bit before, also 
by doing this, it's very visible crowdfunding campaigns. We're able to pull in a lot more people into our network, not just the usual echo chamber. One good example of that is, if Aubrey doesn't mind me giving a little inside information here. During the Sense campaign, they, they had done a campaign earlier for their mitochondrial work, and many of the donors to that campaign were donors they had never seen before. So, it poured in a lot of new people. And this is just some examples of kind of how this spread is starting to happen. You know, people resharing the campaign on their Twitter accounts. This is our, you know, Facebook page growth from last year. As you can see, it's starting to exponentiate. We might be at the, the knee of the curve there, right? And these are just a picture of some advocates that, you know, we didn't tell them to do this. There's, there's a lot of pictures like this, you know, when Longevity Day came up last year, October 15th, I think. Uh, a lot of these were just like popping up and people were sharing them, trying to get their friends involved, having dinner table conversations about it. So this is what we want. And Aubrey had talked about before this idea of longevity escape velocity, but he talked about it in terms of bootstrapping biomedical research, right? You know, if you can get 30 years of healthy life in the next 20 chronological years, you're staying ahead of the curve. But I think this idea also applies equally as well to the public perception of life extension. As you have more and more uh, very visible, very exciting, incredible projects getting funded and people are seeing that and going, oh, you know, what's this? What, you can, you can slow down or reverse the aging process? Really, that's happening now? As that starts to happen, it becomes easier to recruit more people into the cause, easier for the next project to succeed, and so on and so forth until eventually you can really start to move the needle. But because we're in the public eye now, very intentionally, we have to be careful about which projects we're backing, right? Because you don't want this. Here's another example uh, from the Riken Center that happened, I think, a couple of years ago where um, there was this big fraud because they had this paper on how, how easy it is to make uh, induced pluripotent stem cells by just dunking them in an acid bath or something like that. And it set the whole kind of science community on fire. Turned out to be a big fraud. Again, maybe set the whole industry back a year. So you, you want to be careful to not have this. So to help that, you know, we have uh, some excellent people on our scientific advisory board. Some of them you might have seen on people's uh, other slides. So that's important. And now that we have those first two steps in place, here's where the payoff can happen. And this is where I believe we're at right now. How do we leverage this growing grassroots movement that has a call to action? How can we really hit a home run? So. One idea that I think would be very useful is to partner with YouTube celebrities here, many of which I've already started uh, relationships with. For example, this is uh, Minute Earth. You might have noticed that they had asked a question in one of the presidential debates. Um, so they are interested and they're currently working with us on a few videos to get the idea of you know, uh, different types of research. Uh, what is Senolytics? You know, that kind of thing. And Jake Roper here from Vsauce3, it's another huge channel. Uh, I had a personal conversation with him at the YouTube headquarters because sometimes I do some work there. And he's super interested in, in this idea. Idea. And they've all done videos, as you can see, that are about the aging process or related technologies. So, one thing to take a note, here's Hank Green uh, from the SciShow. Uh, notice the numbers here, I'm not sure if you can, because it's a little fuzzy, but that's three and a half million plus uh, subscribers in this video here about stopping aging is 1.7 million views. So, there is a large following for this, so people are receptive. And also notice the like, you know, there's 30,000 people giving a thumbs up on this video and only 500 people giving a thumbs down, so it sounds like people like what they're hearing, right? So, uh, we can eventually mobilize all of these guys together into a cohesive unit. That's the plan, is that if that Minute Earth video goes well, it becomes so much easier to talk to Vsauce 3 and say, hey, can we do a video like this? Hey, Hank Green, can we do a video like this? And then you start to build up this network that's reaching the eyeballs of tens or hundreds of millions of people. This could be our version of the Jimmy Fund or a gateway to it. Another thing is that we should really uh, have an, a keen eye towards identifying leaders in other industries that are related to demographics that can help us. So here, this is uh, Michelle Fan. She's like number one cosmetics person in the cosmetics industry. So she has her own makeup line. She's got millions of followers on every social network and YouTube. If there was, uh, you know, if, if Liz's technology, for example, makes the skin actually younger instead of just looking younger, if people spend billions of dollars on making their skin look younger, 
they'll probably spend it on making their skin actually younger, right? So we can pull in a lot of people here. Um, and, you know, cosmetics is obvious. It's worth noting that this woman here, who's a friend of mine, already helped Aubrey once. Uh, they were running like a fundraiser co uh, competition, and they needed votes to win money. And I said, hey, can you tell your friends to do this? And she did, and they won. So it's already starting. Another demographic that might not be so obvious is video gamers. Um, there are huge video game charities going on right now um, that are raising millions of dollars. So, for example, these guys, uh, Extra Life, I mean, right there in the name, perfect shot for a synergy, right? You know, they're raising money for the Children's Miracle Network. And there's another one actually going on right now called Games Done Quick. Uh, and they're raising millions of dollars for Doctors Without Borders. So this is a very sort of uh, tech-savvy, progressive group of people that you can, again, mobilize to reach millions more people. So I think these are kind of slam dunks that are just waiting in the wings to generate a huge uh, buzz around this research in a positive way. Okay. Also, you, want, you can then, as your profile raises, kind of attract much bigger organizations uh, and companies, right? So there was some talk about, you know, what's going on with Calico, right? But it's, I wanted to just mention that Oliver and I have actually been invited to go to the Google headquarters in a few weeks and talk to Larry Page. So who knows what's going to happen with that, but people are noticing what's going on. And that's, again, part of what I think the whole point of the crowdfunding is, is to get people to see something happening out in the wild and go, wait, wait, wait what's that? And finally, I want to talk about the governmental angle, and this ties with what... Uh, Liz was mentioning earlier as well. So uh, there was a question from the audience, like, how do, you know, why is there so much pushback? Why can't we use compassionate care, et cetera, et cetera? I think DDA asked that question, right? So the question here is, why is it politically so hard, and how can we make political change happen? Because it would also be useful. They could release billions of dollars to this research. So at one of the SENS uh, conferences, I spoke to Frances Colon here, who works for the State Department. She's a science advisor for, uh, was John Kerry at the time. And we had a conversation, and she said, like Liz said, uh, politicians actually, you know, they're, they're sympathetic to this. They think it's a good idea. So I asked her, okay, why can't we get legislation on this? What do they need to see? And her answer to me was, what you need to see is exactly what we're talking about. You need to have a huge grassroots movement that's coming from multiple different organizations so that the government knows, oh, the people care about this, and I can't just marginalize it because it's only coming from SENSE or only coming from BioVia, right? And I'm happy to report that this kind of mindset is already bearing some fruit, right? So uh, as I mentioned, I work with the GHPI here. And just recently, um, there was a lot of buzz about near Barzilai's metformin study, uh, diabetes drug for aging. And uh, there's like a special on National Geographic. So uh, our team helped put researchers like Neil Barzilai and David Sinclair in front of the Senate Appropriations Committee in the United States. And we were very far along in securing many millions of dollars to execute the TAME trial. So again, by raising the profile, it has all these secondary effects. It's near Barzilai. And then finally, how do we now take all these pieces together? So you can really start to pull in celebrities then, like, you know, regular celebrities, not just YouTube celebrities, like what happened with Stand Up For Cancer here. And once you get to that point, you can start to organize huge events like the Komen Race for the Cure here. And then that's at the point where you sort of hit like the war on cancer level, where you have millions of people mobilizing for not just raising funds, but awareness and by proxy putting pressure on governments to say, hey, we want this stuff changed. Until eventually using transformational technologies like CRISPR to improve our lives becomes as de facto as the war on cancer was in, in America. When I grew up, I just thought it was a thing America always did. And I hope the child in 30 years will grow up thinking curing Alzheimer's disease and diseases like that, other diseases of aging, where it's just a thing that our nation and world does. And that's the future that we want. So to recap, we want that clear and inclusive message, consistent call to action that we use to affect massive political and social change. Uh, it's difficult but I think we can, we can do it. And I feel like the winds of change are in our favor. I've noticed a, a big kind of uptick in support for this in the past year or two. And one final note, this again is another picture from the Epic of Gilgamesh when he's actually getting the flower of rejuvenation. Uh, one thing that we shouldn't forget when we're talking to people is that we're not, we're not just a group of people who fear death. I think there's probably a lot of brave souls in this room that would run into a building you know, to save someone. It's not about fearing death. It's about loving life, right? And being part of a movement to preserve that and to really 
extend health and happiness for everyone. And I think that's super exciting. You know, we live at such a crazy, interesting time. People have been thinking about this since people have been writing things down. And right now, we're at the point where we get you get to do something about it. And that's pretty awesome, and we shouldn't forget to communicate that. Um, so, if I've done nothing else today, I hope it has been to convince you that donating to projects like this, the uh, uh, OncoSense, which has been talked about, uh, is super important for a lot of reasons. So definitely uh, donate or share if you can. I want you to consider this your personal call to action to do this or reach out to, you know, don't always assume that, you know, groups, even like SENS, don't need help. We all need support. So if you have any skill, anything that you can do, whether it be paying financially or just doing social media or whatever it is, graphic design, people that are working in the space could use that support. So do something about it. And that is my final point. <laughs> any questions? Hello. Um, in my opinion, something that uh, would uh, really uh, make a, a difference for uh, for the cost of life extension is uh, uh, telling the public that extreme uh, longevity is a good thing. Because, for example, when you see in uh, uh, people say they want I I don't I want to live until 80, but when you see someone who is over 100 and in relatively good shape, they say, "Oh, that's awesome." She they don't say she should have died 20 years ago. Uh, and I mean, for example. Uh, a few years ago, I befriended the oldest person in the world, uh, and I've been visiting her several times, and she's now going to turn 117. And uh, um, when when uh, I say to someone that uh, I know someone who is 117, they uh, they they would say like, "Yeah, but 80 is old." But n no, 80 is not old. It's almost 40 years younger than that. So uh, I think. Uh, more exposure to, to people who are extremely old and in relatively good shape uh, can help uh, change the public perception of aging, even if that extreme age is, of course, nowadays achieved through random luck and so on. And I th think seeing people living really longer, that's going to really motivate people a lot more. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think that's absolutely true. And I think uh, what's important there, it, this is very related to kind of a common fear that people have, you know, uh, that relates to the myth of uh, Tithonus from ancient Greece of uh, this was a goddess who was in love with a mortal man and she basically said, hey Zeus, can you make him immortal so I can love him forever? But she forgot to ask for him to be young forever. So he just kept getting older and older and older. So when you talk to people about living 120 years, that's obviously the first you know, fearful reaction that, that you have is like, oh, I don't want that. So I think it's important to your point of showing that the only real way you can get significant life extension is by getting significant youth and health extension. And that means you're a 100 year old person who's playing basketball and slamming dunks and that kind of thing. So I think that's super important. Yeah, th thank you for this uh, great speech about how to spread the meme. Um, I have uh, f the first thing is uh, really if I, uh, I have the impression that the question is not what can you do at the moment to extend your own lifespan, but what can the people uh, here uh, do to make uh, the world a better place where we can live a longer and healthier lives through uh, medical research. And for this, to be honest, uh, uh, let's say that uh, the, what the people give at the moment, I mean, uh, uh, in the longevity community is uh, a very small amount of money. I think we have also to say not everything is uh, uh, beautiful. And um, no, my, my question is, is a, it's, it's a let's say complicated one, but you didn't speak about uh, why the people think that aging is a good thing. And there is all this uh, uh, psychological uh, mm -hmm. theory around what's called mortality salience or terror management, terror management theory. Yeah. Uh, so the fact that, uh, uh, to summarize it uh, in, in the way I think, uh, so at the moment we have no choice. Uh, li um, living, uh, di dying of old age is something at the same time awful but that we cannot avoid. So we have to do, uh, to, um, to, to make something not consciously, to make it something positive. Okay? Right. Yeah. Uh, so, and I think when you explain this to the people, you decrease 
uh, this aspect, this, uh, and the people um, become aware of this thing, and so it's more uh, easy for them to uh, fight against aging. So my uh, question is, is this why don't you speak about this aspect, or do you think it's better not to speak about this aspect? And no, I think it's super value. I just when I is related to the talk that I had, or the part of the talk about cognitive biases, but I just used two examples and didn't use that one. But yes, absolutely. Uh, so what Didier is talking about here is uh, a psychological phenomenon called terror management theory, and it's basically the fact. Uh, some people argue that all of human civilization is a side effect of this terror management theory, which is that you know somewhere in the back of your mind that you're going to die, and that this is so so soul crushing that you have to come up with coping mechanisms like I'm going to live on through my children or I'm going to have a legacy and this and that. So yes, it's totally uh, a real thing that needs to work its way into the message. I just didn't bring it up earlier. Yeah. So first, thanks for a great talk. I really enjoyed it. So my question will be about narrative. So in your talk, you mentioned that uh, in the situation with Jimmy O, we must inform people. It happened so that uh, I took science communication class and basically we looked into the data about GMO, about uh, atomic energy and other failures of science communication. It happens that it's not the case. I mean, in case of European countries, the countries where awareness about genetics is higher, they have more uh, anti-GMO guys. And it was really puzzling. And uh, current explanation of this is basically uh, people, if it is so, they are more positive for biomedicine because they understand the risk, it's important for them, and they switch on brain when they think about it. But for the food, it's not that important. That's why they uh, look at the image of the world. So they vote for the image of the world where everything is natural, everything is green. Same with atomic energy. They don't care about safety factors about thorium reactors, they vote for the decentralized world of uh, uh, alternative energy rather than centralized world of uh, atomic energy. So in case of longevity, we have those narratives created uh, mostly by Greens that uh, people, they are the human, humankind, it's like a virus that is killing the planet and that uh, growing population is basically bad because we are destroying everything and that science can and technology can also destroy a lot so the people are not voting for such kind of world and the question is how can we create a narrative where without going too much into transhumanism that uh, people will feel well well the, the world without aging but the world that is nice good and people will vote for it Okay. Sorry for the long speech. No, no, no. Uh, that's actually really a uh, su subtle uh, part of cognitive biases here. So what's happening there is, I forget the name of this cognitive bias, but if, you, if someone is predisposed in a certain way and you present them with information that counteracts their uh, ignorance, they believe the first thing even more. They hold on to it tighter. So, yeah. So I think it's not just about the narrative, it's about how you present the narrative. And this is something that many prominent transhumanists, I think, could do a lot better. You don't want to look down on people and give them the impression that if they don't think what you think, that they're a freaking idiot, right? You don't want to tell them what to think. You want to say, hey, isn't this an interesting idea? Let's talk about it together. What are your thoughts, right? It's about how to engage the public. And that's why I think YouTube can be so powerful because it's the whole YouTube success model is, is based on this. All the successful YouTube content creators are all about, let's have a discussion, guys. Let's talk about it. And I think that's how you, you do that. Um, so, um, good talk. And, you know, a few years ago, I also read the book uh, from... Uh, Mahachi and uh, the Emperor of All Maladies, which is a fantastic book, and everyone in the room should read it. It's really good. Um, and so it's really interesting. I saw immediately the parallels between, you know, the aging, the fight against aging, and the fight against cancer. Um, and so one thing that is really important, and that is that um, many people, when they get hit by a disease in themselves or in their family, they become a patient advocate, um, like. Um, Lise Paris was uh, also an example who turned the patient advocate. But there is a very important difference between her and the rest of, of most of the people, and that is they turn against a single disease. 
right? And then they work against that disease. And that's where you fragment the whole biomedical field. Mm -hmm. And what we need to do is to talk to these patient advocates. And for most of these diseases, there is a single risk factor that is mm -hmm. the main one, that's aging. Age. Yeah. And we should tell them, look, Alzheimer's disease is caused by aging. Parkinson's, the same. You know, let's mm -hmm. work together on aging. That's just a remark I wanted to make. Yeah, absolutely no arguments with what you said. Um, you talk about using YouTube channels and uh, a popular uh, way to engage younger people, and I, I guess a lot of people in the hall. Uh, on the other hand, there's a large community that uh, would watch I don't know the the food babe on uh, and say chemicals are yucky uh, on, on YouTube as well. How do you make sure that they won't go to those kind of channels and and go to the channels who have? Well, again, you you can't force people to do what to do, right? All that you can do is just uh, try to increase the amount and the quality of content that has genuinely informative, uh, you know, messaging, and just get that out there. And I do think that you know I don't think. Uh, I forget the name of that person. I don't think she has uh, comparative following to, say, Vsauce, who's got, like, 40 million subscribers on YouTube. Mm -hmm. So, But, yeah, I mean, of course. Thanks uh, for your presentation. Um, first, a comment um, regarding engagement and participation and positive mindsets for this research and all the applications that we're working on. Um, what about the instinct? I mean, when people lack the instinct of survival, then it's very, very difficult for them to engage into seeing a, you know, a positive future you know, as a result of these applications. Well, now, I'm um, sorry. Um, what do you think, from your perception, is a lot more difficult to, to battle against? The fear for life or the fear for death? I would say that I genuinely believe uh, that everyone who is still alive has the instinct for survival because mm -hmm. you haven't killed yourself, right? If you really wanted to die, you'd be dead. So I feel like it's all about uh, these other issues, right? It's, uh, Aubrey has talked about a lot about this in his other talks. Uh, a lot of the reason why people don't immediately jump on this idea is because it seems so impossible, right? We are, all of us, engaged in a battle to the death with death itself. But for most of human history, we haven't conceived of that as a battle because it's been hopeless, yeah. right? So you don't even want to get your hopes up. But if we can show people, like, no, we have real, we have lances and swords now. You can use them to save your mother from Alzheimer's disease. I think if you do that in the right way, you can rally the troops. Uh, I think that has to be the last question for now because I also wanted to pull up uh, for a few minutes Paul Spiegel, who works at the uh, ILA, um, and he worked with us on the major mouse testing program that was successful, and I think you're going to talk about unity okay. in the community. I'm going to do my best. Thank you.